Let Me Be Your Landlord. This is the official podcast of the man behind R.D. Sinto, Inc., real estate maven, visionary, community man, Bob Sinto. Each episode of the Let Me Be Your Landlord show will feature lessons learned through experience, all delivered with the humor, wisdom, and the straightforward nature that our host is known for. I'm John Iannuzzi, and Park City Productions is proud to present this podcast on all major streaming platforms. My company is Bridgeport, Connecticut-based, and the R.D. Sinto story begins in Bridgeport. Before he became a leader in Connecticut corporate real estate, with close to 4.5 million square feet, 50-plus buildings, and an occupancy rate of nearly 98%, which is well above national averages, the Sinto story started in the Park City, with a family-run plumbing business. What takes place over the course of the next six decades is what we will focus on here on this program. Bob Sinto, we appreciate you agreeing to this series, and I've wanted to work with you for a long time. I maintain that your story, your experience, your knowledge will prove to be useful to many people listening, especially those just starting their journey. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. You know, uh, the whole reason why I agree to do this, I would never do this, but the only reason I agree to do it is because I do have a, a, a story, and I'm try- I always try to motivate people, uh, you know, to be the best people they can, and that no matter what handicaps you have, if you have the right spirit and the will to be successful, you can find a way to be successful. So... You know, today I like, I mean, young people, I always like to tell them that I have, you know, whatever I have. I have, you know, two Ferraris, two Bentleys, 52 buildings, you know, a great uh, boat, a beautiful house in Aspen. But when I graduated from high school, I was on a fourth grade reading level. I couldn't read. Kids used to say, give me a nickel, a quarter rather, when I went to Elias House School in third and second grade to say Chuck, because I couldn't say the TR, so you can imagine how it came out. Uh, so, and I worked for my dad for five years, and I made ninety three fifty take home. I only wish I kept one of those checks, and that's where I started. Uh, so the question is, I always like to tell young people, how in the world did I go from that point? to having what I have today, I mean, you know, four and a half million square feet, a hundred people to work for me. So, you know, I want to encourage people that, that it doesn't matter what their handicaps are. I have, I had, I still can't spell anything, you know, my wife will tell you that. Uh, and, the, and the greatest uh, invention is this iPhone, because I love to read, but because I'm dyslexic, I have a trouble decoding words. So now with this phone, all you have to do is type in the word, and you can hear, and you can see what it means. So uh, it's made my reading so much better. So, you know, that's the reason I'm doing this, to try to help as many people as I possibly can. Now, was I correct in saying that this story begins in Bridgeport? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, Hanover Street. Um, I went to Elias House School. Had Mrs. Beach as my kindergarten teacher, and uh, and Mrs. Dillinger was the principal. And uh, I remember one time uh, she re- uh, took out a ruler and smacked my hands, uh, you know, awful. And uh, I went home, and you know, I was still crying when I got home. My wife, my wife, my my my. I guess that was a Freudian slip. I my, my mother. My mother said, what happened? I told her, and my mother was a little Greek lady, but my mother was very special. She took me by the hand. She went back up to Ice House School, and she said to Mrs. Dillon, don't you ever, ever hit my son again. If there's a problem, you call me. I'll take care of it and my son. And I always remember that. But my mother was really unbelievable. You know, when she was 12, her uh, father died. And she had to quit school and begin cleaning houses to help her mother. When she was 16, her mother died. And she had five brothers and sisters. 
And she had a job at a, 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 like a company like AFCO, but it wasn't AFCO. I, I forgot the name of the company, but they made cigarette lighters. They had a patent for cigarette lighters for, for the cars. And she had a job there. And the state came to take away her five brothers and sisters. And she said, well, what are you doing? She goes, I, I have a job. I have an apartment. And these are my responsibilities. She was 16 years old. She took over the she family. took over the family, and uh, and uh, she went one night. She told me she had to go down to see Mayor McCleavy, and she said, "Mayor McCleavy, I don't have any food to feed my children." And then the mayor had a box of food delivered. You know, she was remarkable, and she tough. I mean, she was very very tough, but uh, she's just a wonderful person. You know. And I, you know, I, I, when I work out in the morning, I have a pictures of her downstairs in, in my basement that I've kept. And uh, so she was special. I was lucky. That's tremendous. And I want to talk more about what shaped you. And, and I think also a community like Bridgeport at that time helped shape you know, yeah, yeah. The, the starting point of this story. Well, Bridgeport was different than it is today. You know, uh, Bridgeport uh, ha- has a problem that goes back to the year 1639. In the year 1639, the Protestants got here first, and they made Bridgeport a free city, a free city, meaning that Jews and Catholics could only own real estate in Bridgeport. Now, you know, in 1639, you didn't have you didn't have Google Maps. Okay, you had the Housatonic and Pequannock Rivers, so that is what the landmass was of Bridgeport at that time. And that was only 17 square miles. So now you have a system that you have 17 square miles and you put all the poor people in 17 square miles and Fairfield County is 550 square miles. Okay? So Providence has the same type of inner city problems that Bridgeport has, but their land mass is like half of Fairfield County. So they have a much larger land mass to support the inner city. And not so much economically, but in t- in intellectual. So that you have good people in government, okay? Not that you don't have good people in government in Bridgeport. I'm not saying that. I'm saying but you know, you need to you need to have a larger group of people to help support the inner city, which you don't have. And the state we made a real mistake. You know, I think Connecticut is only one of three states in the country that doesn't have county government. Okay, and with county government, you get a lot of advantages. You get a lot of economics. You get a, a better pay for teachers across the board. Okay, it doesn't matter where you teach in the county, you get the same pay. So, you get, you know, it's, it's a lot of advantages that Bridgeport doesn't have today. I haven't heard a lot of people make that case because I do, I covered Westchester County. You know, you could t- mm-hmm. have one toe in Port Chester and one toe in Greenwich, and it's two completely different forms of, mm-hmm. of government. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's an interesting case that you mm-hmm. make. Uh, I'd like to revisit that. But let's talk more about, you mentioned your mom. You mentioned the city of Bridgeport. What other mentors did you have? And then I also want to find out how does someone listening who's just starting out decide what's a good mentor versus not not every advi- piece of advice is sage. Well, you know, um, I was lucky in that in my sophomore year in high school, someone gave me a uh, bookmark. And the bookmark was a poem by Roger Kipling, if if you can keep your head when all about you are uh, losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when no man doubt you, but make allowances for the doubting too. If you can wait, not be tired of waiting or being hated, don't give away the hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. Now that is just one, that's only one, you know, one part of a four parts in the, in the poem. But and the reason why I could read the poem, if you can keep your head, that it's all one syllable words. This is the first thing I could really read, okay? And But that poem was my roadmap. So every time I had a problem, I could find something in that poem that gave me direction. Uh, like one time I went to see Frank D'Addario uh, because I, I had a piece of property under contract, 1978 uh, timetable. Uh, I had a, it, it was known as an Exxon property in Fairfield at the time, and I put down a, I put down a fifty thousand dollar deposit. I borrowed the fifty thousand from Staples Bank. Okay, uh, and I'll give you that story in a second. And uh, so I had fifty thousand dollars at risk, 
and I had 90 days to close. And, uh, I, and uh, Frank told me to come and see him. So uh, he was on uh, Boston Avenue. He had a waiting room about 10 feet by 10 feet. He told me he'd be there at 8 o'clock. Guess what time I saw him? I didn't see him until 5 o'clock that night. I waited in that room for eight hours. Every time I got up to leave, I recited that one line from the poem, if you can wait and not be tired of waiting. And I sat back down. Okay, And I finally got him to go into the transaction with me. You know, he... He, I only had two. I only had ten days left to close, and he says, "I'll pay you a broker. I don't. I don't need a partner." And I said to him, "I said, listen, uh, I'm not. I'm not looking to be a broker. I'm not looking to find a broker. I'm not. To, I'm trying to find a partner. So if you don't want to be a partner, I have to leave." He, then he says, "Okay, sit down, partner." And that's how he did the deal. But the $50,000 is what I wanted to tell you about. The, the, one of the most important things you have when you're doing business is your credit, your ability to pay back people when you borrow money or you do transactions. It's, you know, that's the most important thing you have is your credit. Now, you can't buy your credit. You have to earn your credit. Okay? And what I actually did, I actually went to Mr. Green at Staples Bank, and I used to borrow money from him. I started off at $1,000 because we had a DNR plumbing checking account there. Uh, at the time, it, it was a very small bank on uh, State Street. And I took the I took the hundred I took the $100,000. I took the $1,000, and I actually went across the street to People's Bank, and I put it in the savings account. And then 90 days later, I went back, and I paid it back. Then four or five months later, I went and borrowed 2000 and I did the same thing. I did the same thing for over three years, and I kept borrowing more money and bring back more money. So then when I needed the $50,000 deposit, I, he gave me the $50,000, and that's how I tied up the property. It's brilliant. And the, and the, reason, why, um, the reason why I knew about the Exxon property, I said to my wife, I said, honey, I said, Exxon Chemical is going into a, a, an application uh, in Fairfield uh, for a, their corporate headquarters. And I wanted, I'm going to go to the zoning meeting. And I said, listen, this is Exxon Chemical. I said, you know, they, you know this way I'll know exactly how, how what people present. I mean, I'll take notes. I had no interest in the property at the time. But I wanted to know what the people were doing. One of the secrets is to find who, who, someone who knows what they're doing and do what they're doing. Emulate. Okay, that's one of the secrets. Don't don't invent any wills. Find someone who's done it before. In other words, if you're thinking of getting a divorce, okay, find someone who's gone through a divorce <laughs> and say, hey, listen, what did I do right? What did you do right? What did you do wrong? What, what, you know, because you're in a state of sh shock. You don't know what to do. Okay, so anyway, so now I'm at this meeting, and, uh, and, get, and the meeting doesn't get over until 5 o'clock in the morning, okay? And, and Exxon put in two real estate evaluations, two environmental, one sound, one traffic, okay? Uh, and so to build the case on why this is on the land. The neighbors showed up. And all they talked about was a man by the name of Ansel Glastine at the time, who was a developer. They said Ansel painted the house of John Selvins, painted his backyard. Did he get uh, painted his porch? Did he get paid for painting John Selvins' porch? Well, John Selvin happened to be one of the most honest guys you're ever going to meet in your life. He wasn't a mayor for a Fairfield for 28 years for no reason. He always did the right thing. But the neighbors were, you know, trying to, you know, pin him up. They were talking about something that had nothing to do with the property, okay? Now, I knew that. So now when, so when the neighbors took an appeal, I knew they can't win the appeal, all right? Because there's nothing in the record that would be contrary to what the commission did, okay? Uh, but the lawyers for Exxon, they just want to run up a bill, so they kept ex extending it, you know, well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? So when they, gave up their, when they gave up the idea of buying it, okay, I went to the neighbor, I went to the owners of the property. I said, I, I would like to buy it. And there, so the guy, uh, uh, Gil, uh, Charles, funny first name, 
he was the lawyer. So he says, how do you know, how do we know you're going to close? I said, well, how do you know Exxon was going to close? Okay, how do you know that? They didn't close, did they? And your clients got nothing. I said, I've got $50,000 here, okay? Your clients can walk out with 50000 So I, that's how I tied it up because I knew I had to find someone because I knew this property would get zoned commercial if once we get to court. I just had to find somebody, you know. And I remember I took out Maury Hoffman, Hoffman Few, okay? Uh, now, I had a Volkswagen, all right? A, a bug. I'm driving around in a bug. It doesn't have any... Diesel. No, no. No? No, it was just an old Volkswagen. And it had no... There was a hose on the bottom of it. So as I went over the bumps, the water would actually <laughs> pop up into the... Okay. So now I have Maury Hoffman and his brother... But I picked them up at Middle Street, and I showed them the property. And we're driving around, and I remember saying to them, I said, listen, you know, if we did a subdivision, I expect to make X dollars, and I want to take 10%. But if we did commercial, I expect them to do Y dollars, I wanted 50%. So I remember Maury says, you know, Bob, we're very impressed with the way you think but anyone driving around with a car with water popping up, we're, we're suspicious of. <laughs> and I said, I don't blame you. They got past their apprehension. Uh, no, no, I didn't. They didn't. They didn't. I had to go to the Dario. But lucky I had them. I had this other group of people. I don't want to mention their names. They would signed the contract with me. But they were, they were going to just wait for my 90 days to run out and they buy the property themselves. Okay? So I had that contract in my briefcase. So I, when I was with the Dario, I was able to throw that on the table and say, listen, I'm just waiting for one more guy to sign, and uh, I'll go with them. But I wanted to go with you because uh, with you, if you wanted the uh, parkway to go in the other direction, I think you can get that to happen. But if, I, if, you, if, you, don't want, if, you, if you don't want to be a partner, and that's when you say, sit down, partner. So. so would you consider some of these folks, I guess, indirectly mentors? You know, the only person I would say would be a mentor was Bob Lesser. You know, he was my attorney for a whole bunch of years. He went to Harvard in, in two years law school and, and Williams in three years. And, you know, this guy could read. I didn't have a word about reading. And uh, he had a lot of real estate experience. He was very ethical. And I never, and I never, heard, him, I never heard him swear. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I ran across a, 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 a person that, you know, you know, that I could depend on, I can ask questions of, you know, you know, I remember one time Jerry Baum, uh, I was in the deal with Jerry Baum on, on uh, Eastern Bagging Paper. And I put him in a deal because remember, I had no money, so I had to find partners on Old Town Road. And neighbors took an appeal, so I couldn't move ahead on the project. But then right around the street in Lindemann, I bought five acres. Again, I, I built my first office building there, and I got People's Bank to give me the mortgage and be my partner in it, okay, at the time. Okay, that was the kind of a deal was structured. And, uh, and Bob says, you, you have to take this commitment letter, and you got to go see Jerry and say to Jerry, here's the deal. If you want to be in this deal with me, you can he goes, you have to do that because you, you got him stuck in the other deal, okay? In the end, we bought we made a deal with the neighbors, and I moved ahead, and I bought Jerry out because, he, you know, he, uh, he, he was in the paper business. And it's hard to explain to someone in the paper business who makes three cents on a product about, you know, giving someone, you know, six months free rent. You know, it doesn't add up to them, you know, so— but Jerry Bond was a very, very, very good person. Very good. And, uh, and, and Bob Lesser was, you know, he was very key. As close to a mentor as... Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. I, Bob had some great assets and some great qualities. And, you know, and, you, know you, learn, you learn from everybody. You know, every, you, have to, you have to, you know, I have a philosophy that I can go in any room and there's someone in that room that's going to tell me something I don't know. You know, when I go to a, a wedding, you have to sit with strangers, you know, at a table. I go and I say to myself, you know, 
There's someone here that's going to tell me something I don't know. I yes, gotta, I love it too. I got to find that. My wife can't stand. No, no, it. I, gotta, I love it. I got to find that. You know, and uh, because everyone has something to offer. You know. So how? So how? If you said you didn't have the money, you have the background that you did in Bridgeport. Where did you get the nerve? I guess to make that first move, and what was the first move? Um, the first. It takes nerve. Yeah. You know, I tell people, no, and I, this is what I tell people. In my business, intelligence is a liability because you can always see too many things that can go wrong. You have to jump into something. I've made mistakes in the very beginning, and, I, and you get out of it as fast as you can, whatever your loss is. I used to always tell people whenever I made a mistake, I said another semester paid at Harvard. For... For the mistake, right? <laughs> okay, all right. So you know, and, and I, you know, you make you make mistakes. You make mistakes. Um, one of the earliest mistakes I and I really learned to overcome it is is try to work on projects beyond your envelope. Trying to work on things you can't bring to a conclusion. I was up in Farmington trying to buy a golf course. I had no right doing that because I didn't have any expert. You know, I was better off building a 15,000-foot warehouse in Stratford that I could rent and move on to the next project, okay? So I learned to get, to get out of things that I can't close, that I can't complete. Stay within. Uh, Dirty Harry is my favorite philosopher from, uh, you know, uh, from the movie Dirty Harry when he says a man must know his limitations, okay? Know what you can do, what you can't do. You know, Socrates says, know thyself, and nothing in excess, right? Now, know thyself means know what you can do, what you can't do, and nothing in excess. In the English language, is translated nothing too much, but in the Greek language, it said nothing too much and nothing too little. All right, so don't pick a goal that you can achieve too easily. Pick a goal that you have to work to get to, and that's important. And I guess how how do you recognize when you're starting to to get in over your head quickly? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that'll pop up right away. You know. <laughs> hey, another philosopher is Ro- Rocky Balboa, okay. who says, of course, you know, it's not how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up. That's any right. any truth to that? Yeah, I think so. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, you you have to. You have to have goals. I mean, I, I have goals every morning. I have a, a, a list in there of, of leases that I want to renew uh, for this year. And um, I look at that list. That I, I start my morning off. I look at that list. And then I always have a yellow pad next to it. And then I write down a yellow pad, the smallest thing I can do today to, to move the big list. So I always have, I have a goal for the year. And what, what tiny thing can I do today to move it along? So I, I try to do small things. I, you know, I try to focus on small things all the time. It's sort of how we ended up here. I had this idea and I kept bothering you. Yeah, until, forever. <laughs> until you did it. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left Wonderful. in our first episode, if you could believe it. Yeah. But when you start, when you get that first idea, how do you beat back the, you know, the demons that say, hey, this is audacious, this is... You're thinking too big here. You have to, uh, the way that happens is that you, you make the first mistake and then you realize you can't do this again. I, the example I just gave you in Farmington, you know, tying up a piece of property, I had no right trying to tie up and, and develop. And so then from then on, I didn't do anything that I knew I couldn't close, couldn't move ahead on. I didn't want to waste any more time. So you have to develop a good philosophy. I thought it would be a good idea at the end of each episode to give people a chance to kind of have a takeaway coursework, do some homework. I know that you have a list of books, books and lectures that you refer people to. Can you just one? Because okay. we're going to keep them waiting. But okay, for this first episode, what is the first one? The first one I think is very, very important. I like to ask people, why do people do business with you? Why do people do business with you? Right? You're going to come up with all kinds of answers. I'm honest. I'm trustworthy. 
Now I'm knowledgeable. The answer is because they like you. So your first job is to be likable. Now you can learn to be likable by going to the by the, uh, the uh, how to win friends and influence people. It's one of the three books I give out. Okay, and there's six things for people to like you. Okay, read those six things, know what they are, and do them. Okay. Uh, now of the six, there's only one I can't teach you. Are you generally interested in other people? Okay. If you're not, then don't go into sales. Do something different. Okay. But if you want to sell, if you want to be, if you want to, you know, be successful, you got to have people that will like you. Okay, that's the first step is to be likable. You know, I scour the newspapers and every day there's an interesting piece on R.D. Sinto. Since it's founding in 1975, you adhered to certain principles and they seem to be working. This is from the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, two, three days ago, the recent lease signings in Shelton, including refined payments, support the sentiment that the city's maintaining its status as a leading commercial hub among munis- municipalities nationwide. Sinto's campus here is the primary driver of that. That was in San Francisco? San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> I hope so, my brother read that. <laughs> so I hope that the next episode we can talk about your three principles okay. that have guided you along this entrepreneurial journey. Perfect. We'll have right. to. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>